Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Beter. Today is June 28, 1980, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 55. As most of you know, I am resuming the AUDIO LETTER today after a silence of four months. My feelings at this moment are hard for me to express, but for all of you who have stood by me when it mattered most, I want to say a few personal words, because without your loyal support I might never have returned to this microphone. Just before I entered my recording studio last February 24, I began to feel slightly ill. At first there was only mild discomfort, but somehow I knew that it was something serious. I tried my best to record AUDIO LETTER No. 54 while I was still able to do it. I got about two-thirds of the way through the recording session before I was overcome by a massive heart attack. I didn't want to let you down, but I simply could not finish. On the way to the hospital I knew that I would not be speaking to you again soon, so I gave instructions for the release of the unrecorded final portion of AUDIO LETTER No. 54 in printed form. During the time since my heart attack last February, my associates have released three progress reports to keep you informed. I won't go over all of that again now, but it was a dark and difficult time for a while, not only for me but also for my associates and especially my wife and three children. I entered those hospital doors on the brink of death, and I truly believed that I had failed in my mission. During at least the first week of my stay in intensive care I felt no will to live. At one point I was even told by my doctors that I had gone through death's door, yet had somehow come back again. The doctors were prepared for the worst, but yet something of a miracle began to unfold. From all over the United States and then Canada and then around the world I began receiving messages of cheer and encouragement. Countless beautiful cards with equally beautiful personal wishes written on them, telegrams telling me of prayer meetings on my behalf, inspirational and religious books and pamphlets of all kinds, letters and books with suggestions to improve my health. There were flowers. There were gifts. There were religious relics. On and on until it grew into an avalanche. For weeks I was not well enough even to look at all these things, but I could not believe my ears as I was told what was taking place. I had entered the hospital spent and exhausted, convinced that all my work had been in vain. But several weeks later when I left the hospital to go home, it was with renewed hope and determination to carry on, and in that spirit I have been regaining my strength against all the odds. So it is that I speak to you once again today. That, my friends, is what you did for me. I will never forget all of you who stood by me in my hour of need and I promise you that I will always do everything in my power never to let you down. It was five years ago this month in June 1975 that I began recording my AUDIO LETTER INTELLIGENCE REPORTS. It was a shaky beginning because I was recovering from my first heart attack, and yet little more than a year later I found myself at the Pentagon because of the AUDIO LETTER. I had been invited there by the late General George S. Brown, then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. My conference with America's top military officer was about the secret nuclear crisis then underway. Of all the information media in the United States, only the AUDIO LETTER had made the crisis public. In AUDIO LETTER No. 16 I told my listeners about the crisis conference with General Brown. General Brown was doing his duty by taking urgent actions to prevent imminent nuclear war, and yet America's controlled major media said not a word. Even after Pentagon spokesmen confirmed my meeting with General Brown to newspaper reporters, there was almost no publicity. From that point onward America's fortunes have gone downhill steadily. Having staved off nuclear disaster for the moment, General Brown found himself deserted and alone. Within weeks after our crisis meeting, General Brown began to be cut down by bad publicity. 
he was quickly neutralized by America's enemies within. He did not even serve out his tour of duty except in name, and soon we were told of his untimely death. In AUDIO LETTERS 17, 21, 23, and 46 I revealed the facts about the downfall of General Brown. While America slept, our last great patriot in government was whittled down, taken away, and finally murdered. Four years ago the prospect of imminent nuclear war sounded unbelievable to most Americans. Something called détente was still in effect, or so we were told but public knowledge is always years behind the truth. So today war fever is all around us. This month I'm beginning anew with my AUDIO LETTER SERIES. Once again I'm doing so on the heels of a heart attack, just as I did five years ago, but this time there is a difference. Five years ago very few Americans would listen seriously to warnings about secret plans for a nuclear war. Today it's a different world. We are all hearing about false nuclear alerts, worries over Russia's military power, and so on. Most of us are waking up far too late. We have waited too late to avoid many great disasters because they have already been set in motion. But if enough people wake up soon, there may still be hope that our planet will survive. That is the goal to which I dedicate my AUDIO LETTER SERIES from this day forward. As I launch year No. 6 of my AUDIO LETTER, I will try to serve you better than ever before. For that purpose I am now introducing the first change in format of my reports in five years. As you know, my standard practice is to present some introductory re remarks followed by three major topics, and I will continue to do this, but from now on I will also add a brief final section called the Last Minute Summary. My new Last Minute Summary will help me do several things better than before. For example, I sometimes receive urgent information at the very last minute before recording an AUDIO LETTER. Whenever this happens from now on, you will hear about it in my Last Minute Summary. I'll also try to highlight major points from the topics I've discussed. By doing these things I want to make my AUDIO LETTER even more up-to-date and more useful to you than ever before. My friends, during the past several months the drums of approaching war have been beating louder and louder, and day by day more Americans are falling into step in the war march. For the first time in a generation the word patriotism is being revived in America, and after years of being trampled into the dust, the American flag is suddenly being waved high for all to see. The Pied Pipers of War are using the symbols of America to lure us into national suicide. They are not trying to revive true patriotism, which is based on loyalty and love for our country. Instead, our so-called leaders are selling us a cheap substitute, tough guy patriotism, based on hatred. Today a patriot is anyone who hates Iran, anyone who hates Russia, anyone who is ready for war, and those who have trampled on our flag for so long are holding it high today for a reason. They know that the American spirit is not dead even though it has been stifled for so long. They know that even today Americans by the millions will still rally around the flag, and so the Pied Pipers are using the Stars and Stripes as their banner to lead us all to war. My three special topics this month are Topic No. 1, The Public Signs of Nuclear War Fever. Topic No. 2, Multiplying Disasters in the Expanding Secret War, and Topic No. 3, Battle to the Death in the Kremlin. Topic No. 1, During the past four months I've had to be silent about the growing dangers of nuclear war, but the visible signs of approaching war have been speaking for themselves. For example, there's the draft registration issue. 
Last March, when this Bolshevik administration first brought it up, tens of thousands of draft age demonstrators took to the streets. So the Bolsheviks who now control our government put it on a back burner to cool off. They waited until summer when students would be home from college, scattered and unable to organize. Then they acted fast. This month it became law, as did another war measure, the Standby Gas Rationing Plan. Measures like these are helping to raise the pitch of war fever by one small degree after another. But to the Bolsheviks here who are responsible for these measures, something else is even more important. Draft registration and gas rationing plans are designed most of all to control you and me. To the Bolsheviks who now infest America, war, even nuclear war, is only a means to an end. The end is their own Bolshevik dictatorship over us all, and they are so consumed with their frenzy for control that they no longer care very much whether the United States wins or loses the war. Either way, they now believe that they will somehow end up with the remains of America within their grasp, and so we are plunging down the road to nuclear suicide. Another sign of this is the series of nuclear false alarms. In AUDIO LETTER No. 52 last November 1979, I called your attention to the first of these false nuclear war alerts, and early this month on June 3 and June 6 there were two more false alerts. As I told you last November, the Bolsheviks here are actually carrying out deliberate tests by means of these false nuclear alerts. The American Strategic Military Forces were designed for the purpose of retaliation against a surprise attack. But now those who control our military strategy are planning for America to strike first, and so Bolshevik agents are now testing ways to falsify all of the early warning signals of a Russian nuclear attack. Once they have perfected their false alarm techniques, they will be ready to set off nuclear war at any moment. By fooling our entire early warning system, they will set off massive retaliation by our ICBMs, missile submarines, and bombers. The crews of missile bunkers, submarines, and bombers will do their duty, believing America has been attacked, but in reality we ourselves will be firing the opening shots of all-out war. America's early warning network involves a number of complex systems. As a result, several different kinds of falsified data will have to be fed into the computers in order to simulate an all-out attack. Each of the false alerts has been testing a different part of this plan. For that reason more false alerts may still take place, but all three nuclear false alarms have had one thing in common. The first line of defense in our early warning system is supposed to be our fleet of early warning satellites over Russia. We're told that they keep a continuous watch for the launching of ICBMs, and sure enough all three nuclear false alarms have started with incorrect satellite signals about Russian ICBMs. My friends, the satellite signals are the easiest part of the Bolshevik plans to falsify a Russian nuclear attack. As I revealed over two years ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 33, the United States no longer has any early warning satellites over Russia. They have long since been blasted out of space by Russia's fleet of Cosmos Interceptor Killer Satellites. Since that time all of the alleged early warning satellite signals monitored daily by NORAD have been artificial, but it is an easy matter to change those signals to make them say that Russian missiles are on the way. It has now been nearly two years since I first reported America's shift to a first-strike nuclear strategy, but the first official admission of this drastic change took place only four months ago on February 21. On that day Pentagon spokesman Thomas Ross said that America might shoot first quote, unquote, in a nuclear war. 
but to this day most Americans still believe that America's military posture is a defensive one, and so we cannot comprehend what we see in the news of mounting nuclear war fever. It is all around us, my friends, and yet we cannot understand because we are not told the truth by our leaders. Day by day we are hearing about nuclear weapons designed for offensive use, but we are conditioned to see only self-defense in all these things, which leaves us unable to see what is really happening. One of the new weapon systems we keep hearing the most about is the so-called MX Mobile Missile. As with everything else, we are told that it is strictly a defensive weapon. It is said that our existing stationary ICBMs might be knocked out by Russia's incoming missiles, so the new MX missiles will have to keep moving around to make them harder to hit. But the stories we're hearing about the MX program are a mixture of half-truths and lies. The whole MX controversy is just a smokescreen to hide America's real mobile missile program. We are told that the giant MX missile system cannot be ready for another half decade, but the fact is that mobile ICBMs are already being deployed here in the United States. Their deployment began over six months ago in late 1979. America's real mobile missile is not the MX, and it is not a defensive weapon. It is intended for use in a nuclear first strike against Russia, and it is called the Minuteman TX, the Traveling Minuteman. Nearly a year and a half ago in AUDIO LETTER No. 42 I revealed America's deployment of one type of mobile missile worldwide. The missiles I talked about then are deployed secretly not only in the United States but in Australia, New Zealand, and elsewhere. But those missiles are only mobile in a limited sense. They can be set up quickly at unprepared sites and move from one site to another from time to time. But America's new mobile missile, the Minuteman TX, is another matter. It's designed to be moved constantly until almost the moment of launch. The public stories about the alleged MX program serve several purposes. For one thing, they are helping to condition us to the growing prospect of nuclear war. Even more importantly, the MX is being used as an excuse for funding which is actually going into the secret TX project. The latest example of this funding trickery took place only a few weeks ago in early June. The Senate Armed Services Committee of the United States approved over $1.5 billion for the MX program. In addition, funding was also authorized for deploying 100 more Minuteman missiles. They look like separate measures, but they're actually both related to the secret Minuteman TX Mobile Missile Project. The publicity surrounding our supposed MX missile program also serves one other very important purpose. That purpose is to keep the Traveling Minuteman Project a secret even from most of those who are working on it. Any large modern weapons program involves many thousands of people and the Minuteman TX program is no exception. There are engineers, technicians, manufacturing personnel, managers, secretaries, and so on, but the vast majority of these people are led to believe that they are working on the MX program. All kinds of projects which are actually meant for the Traveling Minuteman are carried out under the false heading MX. In some cases, other known missile programs are also used as a cover for work on the Traveling Minuteman. What makes this technique successful is the fact that all the work on the program is subdivided into many separate tasks. For example, one engineering design group may be given the job of designing a mobile launch tower. They're told that the design is part of the MX program with operational deployment years away but they are also given the explanation that a few are needed now for developmental purposes, and so they design the launcher, build a few, and deliver them after doing any necessary testing and redesign to make it work properly. Next the launcher design is broken up into several chunks 
by a secret working group within the Minuteman TX project. The various portions of the launcher are then contracted out for production by several different manufacturing concerns. Each individual chunk is unrecognizable, so they have no idea that they are making parts for a secret weapon, and so only a tiny handful of people fully understand what's going on. They are the people who coordinate the whole thing and bring it all together. The Super Secret Minuteman TX program is being carried on almost in the open, but the constant publicity about the supposed MX makes it all unrecognizable to us, and whenever necessary the publicity about the MX cover project is adjusted to maintain the secret. It's a highly sophisticated technique and if you've heard AUDIO LETTER No. 26 it may ring a bell with you. The cover-up technique for the Minuteman TX is very much like what was done in America's Moon program. Project Apollo was a military program from start to finish, but we never realized that because it was flooded with publicity that made us believe otherwise. Today the clever publicity about a decoy program called MX is being masterminded by a man who is uniquely qualified for the task. He is the same man who orchestrated the great publicity that hid the real secrets of our Moon program. His name was once a household word, but he was far more important than we were ever told. He was often called the Voice of the Astronauts. His name? Colonel John Shorty Powers. Early this year on January 19, 1980, there were news reports that Powers had been found dead in his Phoenix home, but that, my friends, was only a cover story to explain his sudden disappearance. He has been tapped in order to coordinate all the MX cover-up stories which we are now hearing. Powers lived alone, and it was little sacrifice for him to go underground for his new secret job. America's deployment of Minuteman TX mobile missiles is secret, and yet it is going on right under our noses. If you live in certain parts of the country, you have a good chance to see for yourself a Minuteman TX railroad shuttle car. You may even have seen one already without knowing what it was. Let me describe it so that you will know what to look for. A TX railroad car is somewhat like a box car, but wider and much taller than most box cars. Also a TX car does not have a flat roof like a box car. Instead a TX car looks a little like a long, slender barn on wheels. The roof has sloping sides several feet high with a narrow flat strip along the top. This unusual shape provides the necessary space for the long, slender ICBM resting on supports inside. The design of the TX railroad car illustrates the rush-rush nature of the whole Minuteman TX program. It was borrowed in large part from an existing design for a special railroad car used by certain aerospace companies, but most TX cars are not even built from scratch. Instead, flat cars used for carrying truck trailers are being commandeered. The flat car is given extra reinforcement if necessary to handle the weight of the missile and launcher. Then the odd-looking TX transporter shell is built on and painted a nondescript brown. The resulting railroad car is a strange combination of old and new. The shell on top may be smooth, fresh, and clean, but the base it is built on is likely to have old paint, rust, and the scars of years on the rails. In certain parts of the country TX cars can be spotted fairly often in the midst of normal freight trains. First, empty TX cars can be spotted in the areas where they are built, such as Chicago and St. Louis. The missiles are built in Washington State, California, and Colorado, so the TX cars can be spotted in those areas. The special mobile launchers are built in Texas near Dallas, and TX cars can be seen in that region. The final mating of the missiles and their launch control systems takes place under direct military supervision. This is done in a vast underground complex in the southwest corner of Fort Hood, Texas. From there the Minuteman TX missile cars head north for operational deployment. This deployment is being coordinated 
from Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota. The Minuteman TX Traveling Missile is being deployed along existing railroad tracks in our northern tier of states. The tracks have recently been removed from normal freight hauling service. This has created outcries from farmers left with no means to get their crops to the market. They are among the first victims of the secret Minuteman TX Traveling Missile Project. When the missiles are fully deployed, they will be in every northernmost state from Washington to Wisconsin. Every Minuteman TX missile now deployed is being shuttled back and forth over a long stretch of railroad track. It rides in its mobile launch car covered against the weather and sightseers. A locomotive moves it up and down the track according to instructions called stochastic programming. These instructions tell the locomotive to speed up, slow down, stop, back up, stop, go forward again in an unpredictable fashion. The idea is to make the missile and its mobile launcher a very difficult target. Right now Russian Cosmospheres are hovering on guard over every TX missile. These platforms, which America decided not to develop in the 1960s, carry beam weapons which could blast the missiles. But as I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 42, American military planners are hoping to stun the Cosmospheres briefly as war begins, and so they are neglecting the Cosmospheres in planning their nuclear first strike with TX missiles. When the Bolsheviks who now dominate America decide to set off Nuclear War I, here is how they presently plan to do it. First they will use their tested methods to swamp NORAD with false warning data of a Russian attack. America's entire strategic retaliatory forces will respond by attacking Russia. But even faster, our secretly deployed Minuteman TX missiles will go to war. In the opening moments of the NORAD war alert, a special attack order will be flashed across the Minuteman TX system. Within 30 seconds the locomotive pulling each missile car will break to a stop. As it does so, explosive bolts will blast the cover off the launch car, exposing the missile inside. At the same time, powerful hydraulic pumps will be started. As soon as the missile car comes to rest, Safety locks will release the missile erector. Within 15 seconds, air-shattering pumps will raise the Minuteman TX ICBM to firing position. Moments later, the launch car will be engulfed in rocket exhaust as the missile streaks off toward Russia. Unlike the United States, Russia does still have early warning satellites. The American missile attack will be detected, and within minutes Russian missiles will be on their way. The early phases of the NORAD war alert will be like the false alarms which have already taken place, but about 10 minutes into the alert the false alarm phase will be over. That is when our ballistic missile radars along the Arctic Circle will first detect the approaching swarms of Russian ICBMs. By means of false alarm trickery and goading Russia into a missile attack, the Bolsheviks here believe they will at last achieve their goal, all-out thermonuclear war. Topic No. 2. Recently a former United States Secretary of Labor, William Ussery, paid a visit to Japan. In more and more fields the United States can no longer compete with Japan in international markets. I warned that this was coming in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar. Yusri went to Japan to see for himself why this is happening, but Yusri was not prepared for the shock he encountered. He visited all kinds of big manufacturing plants in Japan, and everywhere he went he saw assembly lines made up of robots. What we think of as science fiction here in the United States is everyday reality in modern Japan. For example, one of the plants visited by Yusri assembles Datsun automobiles. After his walk through it, the Washington Post quoted him as saying, It was downright scary. We walked for great distances down those aisles, and we didn't see anybody. 
My friends, we in America are living in the past. Our stores may be filled with pretty packages, but the other advanced nations of the world are passing us by. That is one of the things which I have been trying to make you aware of for years through my AUDIO LETTER REPORTS, and now a special report is about to be presented to the White House which confirms part of what I told you. To illustrate this, let me remind you of the many disastrous reversals in America's fortunes which have taken place secretly in recent years. I have made many of them public through my AUDIO LETTER. We have been defeated in space. We have slipped into a hopeless military predicament. As I have made clear in the past, it is our own leaders who have done this to us. For example, nearly 20 years ago our leaders ignored the urgent warnings of the head of the Strategic Air Command. He was the late General Thomas Power. General Power was worried about a threat on the technical horizon of electrogravitic levitating weapons platforms. He wanted the United States to develop these hovering platforms so that we would not be caught by surprise. But as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 32, our leaders paid no attention. They thought they knew better. They had other plans. But our leaders were making a grave mistake. It was only one of many great miscalculations during the past 20 years. They were underestimating the potentials for technical surprise because for the most part America's leaders in and out of government are not trained in science or engineering. Just as General Power had feared, Russia did develop the floating weapons platforms. They are called Cosmospheres, and their deployment over our heads began in late 1977, as I first reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 29. They announced their presence for a while by creating tremendous air booms along America's east coast and elsewhere. This they did by means of defocused blasts from their charged particle beam weapons, and like the Cosmospheres themselves, Russia's operational particle beam weapons came as another surprise to our rulers. The report which is about to go to the White House says not a word about these life and death secrets, but the report does describe the scientific backwardness of America's leaders. In Great Britain, France, Germany, Japan, and especially in Russia, the report points out that things are very different. In those countries the leadership, quote, has a high level of scientific and technical literacy, unquote. By contrast, the report describes the progressive splintering of American society into two groups. One group is the minority who are trained and work in science and engineering. The other group includes the great majority of us. We are being left uneducated about most of the ever-changing realities of modern technology. The report being prepared for the White House is accurate enough as far as it goes, but what it leaves out is even more important than what it says. Because the division of American society into two camps, one technically trained and one not is no accident. The old axiom, divide and conquer, is still true as ever. On one hand, the scientific and engineering community itself is manipulated constantly without being aware of it. The secret Minuteman TX missile project is a typical example, but for the rest of us the situation is even more confusing. So the few who are in a position to pull all the strings have us at their mercy. Earlier this month an outstanding authority on constitutional law passed away, Professor Fred Rodell of Yale University. In a book titled Woe Unto Lawyers, he wrote some words which are a perfect description of our situation today. He said, quote, For every age there is a group of bright boys, learned in their trade and jealous of their learning who blend technical competence with plain and fancy hocus-pocus to make themselves masters of their fellow men." Unquote. In some ways the problems we face today are not new at all. Earlier this month 
This fact was illustrated by a series of biographical dramas on the Public Broadcasting Service. They dealt with the life of a British writer who became Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli. Disraeli spent his life struggling against the things he considered unfair within the British Government, and in a novel he once wrote, quote, The world is governed by very different personages to what is imagined by those who are not behind the scenes, unquote. That was true a century ago, and it is true today. But in other ways today is different from the past. The difference is that incredible technologies which are unthinkable in Disraeli's time are now changing our world. Throughout history there has always been unseen skirmishes, undeclared battles, and unofficial wars, but today these have reached levels never imagined in the past. Even as we see the multiplying public signs of war to come, secret warfare is growing more intense by the day. During the four months of my absence from this microphone there have been too many of these events to discuss in detail, but I have already given you the background for all of these events in past AUDIO LETTERS, so what I will try to do now is simply to remind you of what you already know to understand recent headlines. A bird's-eye view of the past several months will make one thing all too clear. The secret war between the United States and Russia is becoming more and more violent. The Satanic Bolsheviks, who have been overthrown and expelled by Russia, are tightening their stranglehold on our own country, and the secret Christian sect who took over the Kremlin are pressing ahead in a war of attrition. With one hand they are still keeping the lid on all-out war, but with the other hand they are chipping away at America's ability to make war. In the final printed portion of AUDIO LETTER No. 54 last February I gave a warning to expect bad weather in the United States. I described how Russia had begun a campaign of weather modification to reduce crops in the United States. This is in direct retaliation for the Carter Grain Embargo which the Russians regard as starvation politics. As March began, a killer snowstorm blanketed the southeast, and many crops were damaged. A month later, killer rainstorms struck New Orleans much as they had done in February in California, but meanwhile the grain-bearing breadbasket of the Great Plains were becoming parched and dry. By the end of April it was already guaranteed that grain yields in large areas will be reduced this year. As the spring continued, severe weather turned into a record-setting epidemic nationwide. Every single day from May 9 to June 7, tornadoes or other severe and destructive weather struck somewhere in the United States. During the final two weeks of that period, the National Weather Service reported 964 cases of violent weather. On May 29 the United States tried to launch a new weather satellite to watch the fireworks, but the satellite, called NOAA-B, never reached its intended orbit. Earlier this month America's unprecedented weather took a new turn. There was a strange split in the jet stream. Cool northern states grew even colder, and warm southern states boiled over with heat. On June 16 there was even frost in Michigan and Wisconsin while the south sweltered. A few days later on June 20 the so-called Carter Administration gave the first hint that Russia's weather war is really hurting. For the first time there were hints of possibly lifting the Russian grain embargo. But the next day the Bolsheviks changed their minds again. They said the grain embargo will continue, so as of now there is no prospect of an improvement in America's weather. Instead it may well grow worse, and the food shortages I warned about last February are in the making. In AUDIO LETTERS No. 53 and 54 I reported the details of secret warfare involving Iran. Starting in late January, the Bolsheviks here in America 
try to carry out a surprise nuclear attack against Russia. The plan they were following was the one I first made public in AUDIO LETTER No. 37 with some additions. As I reported, the Russians used their Cosmospheres to completely ruin the American attack plan. Nuclear war hysteria had been building fast here in America, but with our secret defeat the war chant stopped abruptly. Our defeat in January was kept out of view and completely secret. But the Bolsheviks here tried again to set off nuclear war just three months later in April. Once again the American war plan met with total failure, but this time our rulers could not hide it completely. The April 25 raid into Iran, supposedly to rescue our hostages, became a disaster that filled the headlines. The American commandos who were sent into Iran tried their best to follow orders and do their duty, but unknown to them, those who had planned the raid did not intend for it to succeed. They were supposed to reach Tehran, but discovered too late that they were too small a force to do the job. As soon as the commandos ran into big trouble, that was to be used as an excuse for American Navy jets to strafe Tehran, and with American passion stirred up, the Iran crisis was to escalate with additional military moves. But for more than a year now Russian intelligence has been informed about even the most secret plans in Washington, and so the Russians were ready. They unraveled the latest Bolshevik war plan in two ways. First a huge armada of Cosmospheres were floating overhead on April 25 as the American helicopter force entered Iran. Using their weather modification capabilities, the Cosmospheres intensified dust storms in the area. They also utilized microwave brain-scrambling radiation to cause nausea, disorientation, and fatigue among the helicopter crews. The Russian Brain Scrambler is the same technology which I first revealed in AUDIO LETTER No. 20. The Russians were hoping to cause the mission to be given up as hopeless without casualties but the American Commando Force reached its first checkpoint, regrouped, and prepared to continue. So the Cosmospheres turned up their brain-scrambling transmitters to full power. One helicopter took off, but veered off crazily and sliced into a C-130 troop transport airplane. Two others prepared to take off, but Cosmospheres overhead fired low-power bursts from their particle beams. Rotor blades flew off and the helicopters went nowhere. At that point it was obvious that it was all over. The raid was aborted, and all energy shifted to efforts to explain away the disaster to the public. Soon the charred bodies of slain commandos were flown home to Dover Air Force Base, Delaware. It was the second time in less than two years for Dover to receive bodies from a secret commando raid by the United States. The first time they had paid the price for a successful operation in Guyana, as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 40, but this time they died in total defeat. The Bolsheviks here might still have stoked up a military crisis over Iran, but the Russians made a chess move to prevent that. On April 28 the individual known to the public as Cyrus Vance resigned as Secretary of State in protest. This checkmated the Bolsheviks by making a public issue of any plans to pursue additional military moves. Another headline story in the Secret War was the explosion of Mount St. Helens in Washington State on May 18. This was followed by a second eruption on May 25, and another major blast this month on June 13. At the same time, there has been a sharp increase in the number of strong earthquakes along the West Coast, especially in California. The first awesome cataclysm on May 18 took government scientists by surprise. They did not expect anything so violent to happen without plenty of warning. But when the mountain blew its top, even the unfortunate government geologists on the scene detected no warning signs. He had only enough time to grab his radio and shout, Vancouver, Vancouver, this is it. 
Then the radio went silent as the blast wave reached him. Up until the awful surprise of May 18, Government spokesmen were playing down Mount St. Helens. No reason to expect much, they kept saying, but now, after the fact, they are changing their tune. Now they say that other volcanic mountains of the Cascade Range also look dangerous. There are just too many earthquakes going on, among other things. At least a dozen mountains in the Pacific Northwest now look suspicious by some accounts, especially Mount Rainier. Mount Baker, Mount Hood, and most of all Mount Shasta in Northern California. Mount Shasta is especially worrisome because it overlooks a major agricultural center, California's Central Valley, but it is also worrisome for other reasons. My friends, what we are seeing are the beginnings of a geophysical disaster along America's west coast. Powerful natural forces are involved, but they are being guided and speeded up by deliberate means. I am talking about geophysical warfare. The stage has been set for the events now underway for over three years. I first reported the presence of Russian nuclear mines in major western dams in AUDIO LETTER No. 23, and one of the dams I named then was the one on Mount Shasta. The following month, in AUDIO LETTER No. 24, I report on Russia's preparations for geophysical warfare. It involved triggering awesome forces around the Pacific Rim, known as the Ring of Fire. America's west coast, which is strategic both militarily and agriculturally, will be devastated. In AUDIO LETTER No. 24, I listed the locations of seven undersea hydrogen bombs on the ocean floor west of Washington, Oregon, and California. I can now reveal that these were detonated one by one in early March. Their tidal wave potential was avoided by firing them individually. Instead, they were used to trigger flows of volcanic magma toward the Cascade Mountain Range. What nature was already doing slowly started speeding up. By mid-May, Mount St. Helens was approaching the eruption point, but left to itself the mountain might have released the tremendous pressures inside slowly in one moderate eruption after another. So the Russians made use of their cosmospheres to make sure that it exploded all at once with awesome power. Just after 8.30 a.m. on that Sunday of May 18, a squadron of cosmospheres started firing at the north peak of the mountain. They fired their particle beams in short pulses, one after another, in succession. The result was a series of machine gun-like explosions and flashes around the summit of Mount St. Helens. The mountain started vibrating, cracks opened up, the pressure could be contained no longer, and the mountain exploded. The particle beam flashes would have been spectacular if seen close up but almost everyone close enough to see them died in the overwhelming blast that followed. The same technique was used again to release the second blast on May 25, but that eruption was not as violent, and a few people who saw the flashes lived to tell about it. On May 26, UPI carried a news item giving the reactions of two witnesses. One said that the volcano, quote, rocked out all of a sudden. We were awake in a hurry. Then the flashes woke us all the way up. The thunder that went with it would rattle your bones. It was like a million little explosions, then a big crash." Unquote. My friends, it remains to be seen just how far the geophysical warfare now underway will go, but I can only remind you of the warning I gave last October 1979 in AUDIO LETTER No. 51. The exact words I used then were, The Kremlin is debating whether the time has come after all to unleash the great man-made catastrophe on America's west coast. Topic No. 3. This topic will be very brief because it's based on information which is very sketchy up to now, but it could turn out to be very important, so I want to alert you now 
without further delay. The worldwide struggle today is between two ancient and bitter enemies. Both want to control Russia and thereby to determine the fate of the world. One faction is that of the atheistic Bolsheviks who seized control of Russia in 1917. The other faction is a secret native Christian sect in Russia who worked for six decades to overthrow the Bolsheviks. For years now the new rulers in the Kremlin have been expelling their old enemies, the old Bolsheviks from Russia, and the Bolsheviks from Russia have been flooding mostly here to the United States, and right under our very noses they are taking away our freedoms in a sophisticated new Bolshevik revolution. I have discussed all this before, especially in AUDIO LETTERS 28, 29, and 38. We are seeing the climax of a larger war of a thousand years. It's the war between the Russians and the Khazars which I described in AUDIO LETTER 50 last fall. In the spring of 79 I revealed that a secret intelligence war of doubles had broken out in Washington. The Bolsheviks here had upset America's former rulers, the four Rockefeller brothers, and were preparing for war. The Russians responded by intervening directly within our own government. The Bolsheviks were replacing key American leaders with doubles, and the Russians were replacing those with their own doubles. I revealed the War of Doubles in AUDIO LETTER 45. The following month I revealed that Russia was deploying a secret weapon in the War of Doubles. They were not human doubles, but genetic replicas of the people they were replacing. These are biological robots of a type known as organic robotoids. They look and act human, but they are not human. Instead. They are advanced products of genetic engineering. Less than six months later, in AUDIO LETTER No. 51, I revealed that the Bolsheviks here in America were counterattacking with their own type of biological robots. These are called synthetic automatons. When I first revealed what I did about man-made genetic replicas of human beings, I braced myself against ridicule, and I have been condemned in countless letters telling me that man cannot create new forms of life. Genetic engineering was not in the news a year ago, but less than two weeks ago the United States Supreme Court handed down a landmark decision. They have proclaimed that new forms of life created by man can be patented, and my friends, there will be a rush to the Patent Office. At this very moment there are over 100 patents pending for man-made life forms. If Professor Frankenstein were alive today, he too could patent his monster. The Russians and the Bolsheviks are locked in a continual tug of war using their genetic replicas. When the White House is occupied by Bolshevik synthetics, American policy reflects a Bolshevik line. But whenever the Russians manage to replace synthetics with their own robotoids, White House policy is made in Moscow. The result is a never-ending series of policy reversals which are mystifying many editorial writers. A famous example was the United States vote against Israel at the United Nations last March. It was defended for two days and then suddenly disavowed. The anti-Israel vote was ordered by Russian robotoids, but two days later the Bolsheviks eliminated them and used their own synthetics to disavow the vote. For many months now this hidden tug of war has been rocking the United States Government, but now there is a chance that the same thing will soon be happening in the Russian Government as well, because during the past two months the Bolsheviks here in America have succeeded in penetrating the Kremlin with synthetics. Several top leaders of the Politburo were recently killed and replaced with Bolshevik synthetics. One of these was the Kremlin strongman, Admiral Gorshkov. The Bolsheviks are using their synthetics in a new bid to retake control of Russia, but the ruling group in the Kremlin understand what they are up against and they are fighting back. A few weeks ago the Bolsheviks were on the verge of gaining the upper hand. Now, though, 
they have lost their initial advantage of surprise. In addition, the Bolsheviks are apparently having difficulties with the synthetics which they send into the Kremlin. Several synthetics have disobeyed their Bolshevik programming. Right now the situation is far from clear, but one thing is certain. An unseen battle to the death is underway now in the Kremlin, and the outcome will affect everyone on the face of the earth. It is time now to give you my last-minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I have tried to give you a bird's-eye view of events over the past several months. The bottom line is that the drums of approaching nuclear war are beating louder and louder. Even more urgently, secret warfare is already underway, and it is becoming more and more violent. The explosion of Mount St. Helens last month was brought about by geophysical warfare. Likewise, the severe weather patterns in the United States over the past several months have been produced by weather warfare. The Russians are doing this in retaliation for the giant grain embargo by the Carter Administration. The Russian weather war against the United States is intended to reduce our crops. In the Southwest, Brutal heat is baking crops and killing cattle, and in the northern Great Plains grain is dying in a five-state region of severe drought. Russia's enemies here are not you and me, but the Bolsheviks who are now in control of our government. The Bolsheviks here are also the deadly enemies of you and me. In 1917 Christian Russia was dragged down into the hell of Bolshevism through the dark tunnel of war. Now the Bolsheviks are being expelled from Russia, so they are trying to do it all over again here in America. They are determined to throw America's nuclear arsenal at Russia, win or lose, because either way the Bolsheviks expect to pick up the pieces here in complete Bolshevik dictatorship. My friends, these are dangerous times indeed but we must not lose heart. If you are ever tempted to throw up your hands and say, I can't do anything, just think this over. All the weapons of war, all the propaganda, and all the controls of government has just one purpose. That purpose is to control you. If you give up and just close your eyes, you are giving them the very thing they want most. But as long as you keep your eyes open, see the truth as best you can, and hold on to it, you are defeating them. Our Lord Jesus Christ said it long ago, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.